Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. Our final US Open power rankings are here. Now before you go crazy, on screen is not our US Open power rankings. It was our final Wimbledon power rankings. We're going to go through and change them, finalize them going into the last Grand Slam of the year. Cannot wait to get into it, especially after that Cincinnati epic between Djokovic and Alcaraz. Djokovic edging it, of course. And look, I mean... I think early doors, we can say they're probably going to be one or two respectively. But the rest of the field, that's what's going to get interesting. We're going to see who is going to be able to challenge for the title. If you haven't watched our US Open Power Ranking videos before, the way we do it is as so. The first category you look at and the main character category that we cater for is current form. So looking at their most recent matches, most recent tournaments, especially on hardcore. So we'll be looking a lot into the Toronto uh, masters in canada and also the cincinnati masters of course then we will place some importance but not as much importance on recent results at that slam so the us open that is and then finally we'll look at again placing some importance on their results this year so far so how they looked uh, in the year to date okay let's get into it uh, before we do remember to hit that like button do subscribe if you're new and do leave a rating or review if you're listening on a podcast platform Number one and two, look, I mean, I think we can be pretty safe in our picks when we say Djokovic is at one and Alcaraz at two. Djokovic has only played one warm-up event before the US Open. Last year, he didn't even play the US Open because of uh, the entry situation, because of vaccination status. This year, he's played just Cincinnati. He cited fatigue for Toronto, uh, which means that he is going into the US Open unbeaten in the US Open series so far, which is, you know, great. Yes, only one tournament, but it's still a Masters tournament. And he beat some very, very good opponents as well. And in fact, if you want to know who he beat, I have it up here. Derek Fakina, Monfils, Taylor Fritz, Zverev, and Alcaraz. So, I mean, that's not bad going, right? And what you'd expect, I guess, from a Masters 1000 tournament, but look, it could have definitely been an easier route. That's for sure. Then if we talk about Alcaraz, I think Alcaraz at two, and the reason why is just because he lost to, to Djokovic really in Cincinnati. Uh, that's It's really as simple as that because in Toronto, if he'd gone on to win that then, or even made the final, to be honest with you, I would have said we probably need to put Alcaraz at one just because he's won more matches, especially under his belt and recent form. You know, he's probably up there, but the fact that he didn't do as well in Toronto, he lost to Tommy Paul in the quarterfinals in three sets. And I would argue that the match against Huber had catch in the round of 16, where he won 3 6 7 6 7 6. He probably should have lost that as well. I think her catch didn't play well at all in the two tiebreakers. Also beat Ben Shelter, which was a good result there. But in Cincinnati, uh, that's where I was pretty impressed, even though he didn't play his best tennis. He came through in three sets in all of his matches apart from the final, but he battled through and then he really raised his level in the final, which I expected both players did. And it ended up being an epic final. Uh, in my opinion, I would say the best best of three match this year uh, on, on the ATP side anyway. Thought it was really, really good. Uh, beat Thompson, Paul, Purcell and her catch all in three sets. And then in the final, lost to Djokovic. Uh, Five seven seven six seven six. So look, a really really good performance though. There was not much in it at all. It could have gone either way. Djokovic so edges it, and I do think he has a slight mental edge going into the US Open as well, which is why I put him at one. You might say, well, why didn't you say that about the Cincinnati match when Alcaraz had beaten Djokovic at Wimbledon? And the reason why I say that is because it's a different surface, and I do think he had some sort of mental edge, but it, it wasn't surface dependent, if that makes sense. And I do think the fact that the first time they've met on hard court, Djokovic has won uh, in a very, very tight match as well. I think bodes well for him going into the US Open. And I think that's why Alcaraz just below Djokovic for me in my US Open power rankings. And I think form-wise as well, Djokovic played better tennis throughout the whole tournament before that final, that is, because Alcaraz played some incredible tennis in the final. I think let's not get it twisted. Then let's talk about the rest of the field because that's where it gets really interesting. So Holger Runa is at number three. Uh, he's not going to be there at number three. I'm just going to be honest with you. He 
has not had a very good US Open series so far. Uh, he's lost in the first round of both Canada and Cincinnati. Lost to Marcus Giron in three sets in Canada. In Cincinnati, lost to McDonald, the American player, 6-4, two-love walkover. He was carrying a slight injury by the looks of it, and it seems like he's going to be fit and ready for the US Open, which is great because I think he should actually have a good time on those courts. I think his game is... He's got an all-court game for one, and I think it'll be suited to the slightly slower hard courts at the US Open. When I say slightly slow, I mean slightly slower than the Australian Open, where the courts are very, very quick. But in saying that, he made the semi-final of Wimbledon, so it's not to say that he can't go far. Or he made the quarterfinals of Wimbledon anyway. So it's not, not to say that he's not able to, you know, play well on quicker surfaces. But I think his game is still slightly better on the slower courts, you could argue. Although he's on the Paris Masters indoors, so maybe just ignore me. Um, but yeah, he's not going to be at three. He, I'll put him... Uh, I mean, I don't even think he deserves to be just outside. I just don't think he's there. Uh, and that might be harsh to say, given that he's done well this year. Uh, generally speaking, quarterfinals at Wimbledon, semifinals at Queens, French Open quarterfinals as well. But hasn't really shown anything for me in the last two tournaments. Now, you could say, well, Fazan, you know, that you say that, but he's carrying an injury. But if we look at the Masters tournaments or the hardcore tournaments before the clay court swing, Miami round of 16 lost to Taylor Fritz. And then in Indian Wells, he lost to Stan Wawrinka in the second round. I mean, his hardcore record hasn't been amazing. Even at the Sri Open, he lost... To Andre Rublev in the fourth round had match points, didn't convert. So uh, I think it's safe to say that he probably shouldn't be in there. Number three for me is a pretty straightforward pick, and I'm going to go for Yannick Sinner. He won the Canadian Open. He beat Berrettini, Murray had a walk over there. But Berrettini, Monfils, Tommy Paul, Dimoner to win the title. I was really impressed with him. He has definitely improved and is improving his serve he's winning more free points on it which is key we know what he can do from the back of the court he's got an extremely powerful baseline game uh you know one of the best in the business and he's got an incredible running forehand as well which uh, definitely puts him in great positions especially when he's wanting to transition from defense to attack um, i'm not going to talk about his game in huge detail because this isn't a yannick sinner analysis video but uh, we are going to do a contender profile well, we are going to be doing contender profiles on certain players, and he's going to be one of them. So do keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you want to know more about his style, his game, his recent results, and then also how, how we think he's going to do at the US Open results-wise. Uh, but look, I mean, I think he should be challenging for the title. He is, you know, as I said, he's picked up some really good form. And not just that, I do think that he... We'll look at last year at the US Open and say, look, Alcaraz won the title. I had a match point against Alcaraz in that semi-final. I lost him five sets. I Sorry, in that quarterfinal. I can't say semi-final in that quarterfinal against um, Alcaraz, and I lost. Uh, that could have been me. And, and I think that's safe to say. I don't think it's a crazy thing to say because I think he would have beaten TFO, even though TFO was playing some incredible tennis. And I think he would have been Katsvarud as well. So Yannick Sinner at three. Uh, then at four, uh, we had Medvedev uh, for Wimbledon. I mean, let's have a look at his results. He lost in the quarterfinals to Dimoner in Canada. Beat Mossetti and Arnaldi. Neither player is a hardcore specialist. Beat Mossetti again in Cincinnati. Lost to Zverev. He's probably in there just because of bulk of work on hard courts, generally speaking. Um you know, Miami made the one beat Sinner in the final, beat Hatchin of Eubanks. When we're going back now, though, before the clay court swing, Indian Wells made the final, lost Alcaraz. Um, Dubai, you know, won it, beat Rublev. Qatar lost, uh, sorry, beat Murray in the final. Uh, Rotterdam beat Sinner in the final. I mean, he had a ridiculous run, right? And then third round of Australia, because he beat, he lost to, sorry, even Sebastian Corder, who played some really good tennis. And uh, he won't be in these power rankings, but if he was fit for the whole season, he definitely could be because he's got incredible talent. Okay. So what I would say is... <sighs> I'm not sure if Medvedev deserves to be at four if we're talking about current form. 
Um, I don't think he does. And I'm going to put someone else in there, and I'm going to explain to you why I put them in there, because it's not just the results in terms of their placings and how they've looked. Um, sorry, well, it's not just to do with, oh, this person's made a quarter final, this person's made a semi final, but it's what tournaments and also what who has been the opposition, who have they beaten or who have they lost to. So I'm going to go for her catch at four. Now, you might say that's a bit of a brave pick, but I'll tell you why. Cincinnati, he made the semi finals. Now, this is who he beat Kokinakis, right? Okay, solid win. You're like, hey, yeah, but expected to win it. Chorich, who was the defending champion, beat him in three sets. Sitsipas, Australian Open finalist this year, beat him in straight sets. Poprin, who was a surprise package in Cincinnati, beat him in the quarterfinals, and then lost to Alcaraz in the semi finals. Now, he pushed Alcaraz, and again, he had lost a tiebreaker, and he's lost the last three tiebreakers against Alcaraz. And if he'd won them, he would have come through and beaten Alcaraz in both matches. He had chances. Uh, he lost 2-6, 7-6, 6-3. That second set tiebreaker, again, he doesn't tend to play well in the tiebreakers against Alcaraz from what I've seen. He misses a lot of first serves, and it just doesn't give him the ability to win a lot of free points in the tiebreakers. And some players, they raise their game in tiebreakers. And I think, generally speaking, her catch does tend to. But against Alcaraz, I haven't seen it. And they, those are two really crucial matches where he played really well and he just wasn't able to get himself over the line. So uh, something to look out for at the US Open. But I think given the results and his level, it's been very, very high. Uh, Canada even beat Bublik, beat Kermanovic, and then lost Alcaraz 3 6 7 6 7 6. Again, those two tiebreakers, he wins just one of them even. And he goes through and beats Alcaraz. So look, and he would have been the favorite against Tommy Paul. And he would have, in my opinion, made the semifinals at least again. So I think he should be at four. And I think the level he's shown has been really impressive. I think he's been serving especially well. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how he gets on at um, the US Open. And I hope for his sake, because he hasn't had really good results at the Slam so far in his career, that he does finally have a good time at the slams because he deserves it he's a really really good player and uh, one of the nicest guys on tour and i do like his style because it's serve and volley and look there's not a huge amount of players on tour that serve volley like that unless your name's maxim cressy uh you i don't think it's a dying dying breed because i think it is coming back like we see alcraz will serve and volley and he'll transition a lot same with runa for example, but yeah, look, I, I do think it's still a a unique breed to tennis so far, and I, I want him to do well. To be honest, I just I enjoy watching him play uh, from a more personal standpoint. In terms of number five, so Bublik, <laughs> he's not going to be there. He hasn't had the best results in the hard court swing, and the grass does suit his game. He's got a massive game, massive serve, and he wins a lot of free points. I mean, he lost in the first round to. Uh, her catch in Canada uh, didn't play Cincinnati. Uh, City Open lost to Monfils, who we might have to talk about a little bit because Monfils. Look, I mean, I don't think I personally don't think he's going to be in our power rankings, but he might be just outside because he had some good results, and it might be difficult to keep him out of it. To be honest, so we'll talk about him, and I'll put him just outside for now, and we can talk about him in more depth soon. Um, but in terms of the rest, so Bublik won't be at five. I think we actually have to go a bit left field here and stay with me on this one. I think we have to go for Alex Dimona. And I'll tell you why. I've been impressed with his level uh, this US Open series so far. I think he's really upped his game in terms of, one, his serve efficiency, in terms of being able to do spots better and the potency behind his serve. Uh, he's definitely bulked up his ground strokes, and I think his shot tolerance has always been good, but he's able to have more effective offense behind his serve. And I think he's having a easier time of being able to hold serve service games, whereas I think in the past it was like a fight for his life in a lot of instances. Um, Results-wise, I mean, he's had some good results. I mean, the quarterfinals of Atlanta beat Kokonakas, lost to Amber, uh, Los Carbos, he made the final, he beat 
Mansouri, Toronto, Paul, Kepfer lost the sixth person in the final. So you could say not amazing opposition, but I think Tommy Paul is in there. That's a good one. Uh, sixth person being in the final, no shame in that, I guess. Uh, but then if you look at the rest of his tournaments, there's some really impressive results here, right? I mean, he made his first Masters 1000 final after beating Cam Nori, great win, Diallo, Fritz in three sets, Medvedev in straight sets. I mean, what a win that was. Derek Fakina in straights and then lost to Sinner in the final. So, look, I mean, I think Dimana has to be up there and I think rightly so. Uh, so we'll put Dimana here at five. Cincinnati, he lost to Monfils in the round of 32. Fine, fine. Um, that's that's okay. I mean, <laughs> Monfils, as I said, has been playing some good tennis. Right, Andre Rublev. Now, Andre Rublev is a strange case. Um, we'll talk about why in a second. He has had a pretty good season, generally speaking, but I don't think he has been the best since um, Wimbledon. Yeah, so if we look at his results... Rublev, that is. He lost in the first round to Rusevori. 7 6 5 7 7 6. Canada. He... And in Canada, he lost to McDonald in the first round. So, Rublev, look, I mean, that's not a good run so far. Uh, two first round losses. And it's a shame because he actually looked really good. Uh, for me, anyway. Uh, just before Wimbledon as well. Uh, and on the clay, he's looked very good. But it just seems like. Maybe his form's taking a little bit of a dip. He plays so many matches as well. That that could be the reason. But he won't be up there for me. Uh, in Not in this power rankings anyway. In terms of others, I mean, it's difficult because there's not really a whole lot of players that I've been super impressed by. Just because we know about, obviously, Djokovic and Alcaraz. Sinner, her catch has been pretty good. Demoner as well. Um, normally we talk about Holger Rune, but he just hasn't been in great form, in all honesty. Uh, so, look, I mean, Kyrgios is not playing. Uh, Zverev, I think, will be up there. He's had some pretty good results. Uh, we can talk about Zverev. Uh, he's definitely found some form after that injury, and of course, he it was a horrific injury last year at, the, at Roland Garros, and you know, since then, it's been a little bit difficult, a little bit up and down. Uh, but I would say he's been playing some of his best tennis, actually, recently. Uh, in Canada, he lost to Davidic Fikina in the second round, although he beat Griegsbor, uh just before that in the first round, which was a good win because Griegsbor has been playing some really good tennis this year especially. Uh, but then what really stood out was the win over Medvedev in Cincinnati. And Medvedev, we know how good he is, of course, uh, especially on the hard courts. Uh, and the fact that he beat him, and not only beat him, but we can go through uh, the matches that he won. He beat Dimitrov, Nishioka, Medvedev, Manorino. And then, to be fair against Djokovic, he lost 7-6, 7-5. And in honesty, that tiebreaker, I think he would have been a bit disappointed because, you know, I saw him maybe not play as well as he could have played in that tiebreaker, but it was a high-level match, to be fair. And, you know, he, it showed that he wasn't too far off. But a semi-final there as well. So I think he's he's up there. Uh, so I'd put Zverev at six. Now, at seven is where it starts to get interesting because now we start kind of digging deep into other people's results. Rude won't be up there. Cincinnati, first round loss to Purcell. And Canadian Open lost to Derek Fakina in the second round. And look, I mean, we keep on talking about Derek Fakina, so maybe we need to look at him as well because... He seems to be beating all these people. I mean, second round in Cincinnati, lost to Djokovic. No shame in that. Canada made the semi-finals, um, beating JJ Wolfs, Zverev, Rude, and McDonald. Lost to Demoner. So I think he'll be in there, in the conversation at least, uh, for sure. And in terms of others... I think Medvedev is going to have to be in there. Round of 16 and then quarterfinal. Round of 16 in Cincinnati, quarterfinal in Canada. Lost to Dimona in Canada, but beat Mussetti on Naldi. Cincinnati beat Mussetti and then lost to Zverev in three tight sets. So given also his prior performances at the US Open, being a former champion, etc., I think it's fair to put him in there. 
Then if we look at some other players, because there are some players who've had some underwhelming results. Uh, we can talk about Sitsipas beat Ben Shelton at Cincinnati and then lost her catch in straight sets. At the Canadian Open, he lost in the first round to Monfils. So, I mean, Sitsipas can stay outside. I don't really see him being anywhere else, in, in all honesty. Um, I just don't think he's played well enough. Uh, for me to warrant putting him in my top 10. Someone who has played quite well is Gal One Feast. Now, a bit of a weird choice, you might say, to put in the top 10. Atlanta lost in the first round. City openly lost in round of 16, but after beating Bublik on the way there, lost to Greek Sport, who made the final. Now, those are two tournaments that are lower tier tournaments. Two master tournaments, though. Uh, beat Eubanks, Sitsipas, Vukic, and then lost to Sinner in three sets in the quarterfinals. In Cincinnati, he beat Nori, Dimoner, and then beat one. F- sorry, and then lost to Djokovic. Now Dimoner's on this list, uh, so I think Monfils needs to be in there somewhere. I'm not saying he's going to be at eight, but he'll be in there, I think. Uh, Darius Fakina, by the way, semi-final of Canada. We were saying, weren't we? And. Cincinnati lost to Djokovic. I think we're going to put Darius Fakina in there. I think, well, look, if we're basing this on recent form, he's made a semi final of a Masters tournament, beating the US Open finalists from last year, beating Zverev's one and two as well. I mean, that's pretty damn good. Purcell as well, we're going to talk about him. A round of 32. Uh, Canada's his second round, but beat Felix. I mean, he hasn't been in great form, Felix, to be fair. City Open lost in the first round. Atlanta lost to Nakashima in the first round, but then since the Nazi made the quarters, beat Van Ash, Poprin, Harris, Rude, Vavrinka lost to Alcraz in three. He's been in some good form. Uh, those are some good wins. Greek Sport had a good City Open, made the final. Canada and Cincinnati, though, first round losses. That's the issue that he has. Fritz, final one Atlanta. Semi final of the City Open. Let's see who you beat, though. You beat Ruya Bing, Nishikori, JJ Wolf, Fukic. Okay, some solid wins. Uh, Spider, Murray, Thompson. And then lost in the final, sorry, lost in the semi finals of the City Open in three to Greek Sport. Canadian Open beat Amber, lost to Dimino in three, lost to Djokovic in Cincinnati. Lehechka, Sanego, Leovic on the way, and then got bageled by Djokovic in the first set, uh, second set of 6 4. So I think he'll be in there, won't he? He'll be there or thereabouts. He has been a little bit underwhelming, to say the least, um, but I think we can put Fritz in there at eight, or well, sorry, at nine even. Um, I think, actually, should he be above Doris Rikina? No, I think Rikina's had better Masters 1000 results, so I think that's pretty fair. Uh, Dan Evans won City Open. Atlanta lost in the first round. Canadian Open first round loss. Cincinnati first round loss. I think he can be just outside. I think it's probably fair, because even though he won a tournament, it was a 250, and then or 500, actually, but level of opposition not quite up to scratch and then lost in the first round of both Masters 1000 tournaments. Uh, TFO as well, someone that we haven't really talked about. Lost to Raonic in the first round of Canadian Open. Cincinnati lost in the second round to Vavrinka City Open. Quarterfinals. I don't think he warrants being in the top 10. We'll put him just outside. Obviously made the semifinals last year as well. Um... Yeah. Uh, Greek Sport. Greek Sport. Yeah, has, he'll stay just outside. Just hasn't had good enough results in the Masters tournament to me. And, you know, though I place a lot of weight on those. Monfils has got to be in there for me. Look, I mean, quarterfinal of Canada or the Canadian Open, and then. Cincinnati made round of 16. City Open, round of 16 as well. Atlanta lost the first round. Doesn't matter though. Uh, it's not as big a tournament. So I'm going to go one feast at 10, uh, which is a little bit ambitious, but I think that's my 10. Let me just 
double check. I mean, Purcell, I think he'll. I'll have Purcell in uh, the just outside as well. But I think that's okay. I'm trying to think if I've missed anyone. But I reckon. I reckon that's fine. Let me just double check. Knowing me, I've probably missed like a massive name. But I think we're okay, honestly. Manorino, no, I mean... A rinker, Tommy Paul. I mean, Tommy Paul. Do we need to talk about Tommy Paul? Be Alcaraz as well. Canada, I mean, round of 16 since the Natty. Canadian semi-finals. Right, okay. We gotta talk about Tommy Paul. Should he be in there? He beat Kemanovic on Burr, lost to Alcaraz, beat Sarundalo Giron, Schwartzman, Alcaraz, lost Carbos, quarterfinals lost to Dimana. I mean I think he should be there or thereabouts, shouldn't he really? We're talking about Rana 16, 75, so I think he should be in there instead of Monfils. I think that's fair. And Monfils we'll have to put to just outside, I think. Um, we'll put to just outside. I think that's... Is that okay? Does Darius Fakina deserve to be at 8? Have I... Put him too high. Let's have a look. No, no. I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. That's fine. Derek Fakina at 8. Right, okay. So let's let's finalize these power rankings for the US Open. So number 1, Djokovic. Number 2, Alcaraz. Number 3, Sinner. Number 4, Hakach. Number 5, Dimana. Number 6, Zverev. Number 7, Medvedev. Number 8, Derek Fakina. Number 9, Fritz. Number 10, Tommy Paul. Just outside, I've got Monfils, who's had a really good period, so he's just missed out. He would have been my first in. Sissipas, who's kind of more a very, very far away thought. Uh, Greeks boy has been in some good form, and also Dan Evans. And then we've got TFO and Purcell. TFO mainly because of his results and kind of star ability, and also his result last year. Purcell has just been in really good form. He is a true. Uh, current form phenomenon at the moment, and he's been playing really, really well. Guys, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Who do you think is or should be in the top 10, and what's your top 10 power rankings going into the US Open? Try and base it on the criteria that I've based it on, uh, rather than just who you think is the best players, <laughs> because uh, that, that kind of defeats the purpose. Thank you very much, guys. Stay safe and well. We'll see you in the next video.